just to look at it from critically, how do you look at the whole structure of cinema which has changed this OTTs and which format do you like the most personally? Like you want to see your film theatrically or you are okay with OTT as well? See, every filmmaker worth the salt would want to see their film in theatrically. That's a given. But I feel OTT has definitely democratized uh, viewing, democratized the way films are funded. Narratives have changed, narratives have evolved. Uh, there is a lot of freedom in terms of how uh, you can be very immersive, you can be expansive in your characters. Even subplots get a lot of things. You know, so that way I think it really helps. Because filmmakers like me, instantly I get to have my stuff seen by two, 200 countries in one instance. So that is a very good change. Because see, like a film like Gili Puchi that I mentioned earlier, I couldn't have made a theatrical out of it. Nobody would pay for it. Nobody would, I don't know, want to go to a theater and see it. So yes, I got to say those narratives. If not for OTT, it wouldn't have been possible. The craft of storytelling is more important than the messaging because sometimes it also happens that some films are very heavy in their political messaging and survive through the morality of a few public. But in, in, in terms of craft, these some, some of the films are very weak. So how do you resolve this you know, dilemma of putting the right politics and as well as making film which is aesthetically pleasing. See, first of all, the idea or the, the definition of entertainment is a little lopsided. Because you are, traditionally the idea is that escape is cinema, dimaag ghar pe rakke jao. All of those connotations are applied to entertainment. But it could also be, you know, stuff that's engaging, that's motivating, that's that makes you think and ponder, that makes you question, that makes you think about things that differ in opinions. It could want to maybe uh, talk about a new culture that you've not known. It could talk about various things, gender, sexuality, and all of these things that could matter. And it could mean that it, it provokes a certain feeling in you. It may be not always be ha ha ha, but it could also be something that you go home and you think about it. So that is one example that how, like even if you look at Swades, that film, I mean, at that time, I really, really loved it. I now have some, certain issues with it, but even that could be like, it, it wasn't a box office success, but it made you, you really want to go back and watch it. And it did bring change where many people who uh, came back. Many wrong people came back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <But yeah. laughs> I so agree with you. <laughs> Your recent Made in Heaven. Um, I think I just hit my Achilles heel right here. Sorry? I hit my Achilles heel. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, hi, Neeraj. Hi, Anurag. It's nice to meet you in a formal setting. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. I was thinking about this session last night and I remember that in 2008 or 9, I was in this vlo uh, very famous vlog at that time of cinephiles uh, named uh, Passion for Cinema. And at that time, you used to um, write for that vlog. Yes. And yes. I, I was a uh, commentator on like comment section guy on the blog and when I was a comment section I you also like time, and yeah. I also used to um, troll people on comments so maybe I trolled you as well at that time I must I must have trolled you back as well, <laughs> I'm sure. so so at that time I mean it was a very interesting time and um, we also made a film together not together but for a competition it was a one minute filmmaking challenge competition and you made a film um, I think on 15th August or 26th January. Don't remind them of that. And I, I, no, I, we should, we should it, remember. It's a very embarrassing start and from. I, you were also on the thing? Yeah, yeah I, I participated but I lost and your film won. At, 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 at. Oh wow, I had no idea. Yeah, I remember because of that, because I lost. So, um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, we met many years back but I didn't know what this connection. Wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the point of reminding these things was that it's been a long journey, 2007, 8. Um, you were, a, as a writer, trying to analyze film, trying to decode film. And I was also following you on Facebook, where you used to write a um, lot about world cinema, your favorite filmmakers, like how you used to watch eight hours film of, of that <laughs> director, I forgot his name, the Tarko Eski from... What, what no, was Bellatar. Bellatar, yeah. So, um, and now we are in 2023 in between made so many great, remarkable work. Uh, so if you reflect back on your journey, how do you see um, how, in fact, I'm very interested to know about the style 
as a filmmaker style uh, do you think it has evolved into something else or i mean it has been a continuous experimentation i mean i actually haven't had a very prolific career in the past 10 years that i've here uh no thanks to my imposter syndrome and depression that i battle with uh but that's another story but i i think i've i made one feature film couple of shorts couple of tv shows and uh commercials so uh yeah i mean i remember what you're referring to at a, at a point where i think my my uh, induction into cinema or my orientation into cinema precedes me actually joining the industry it was way back when i was actually writing on this blog that he mentioned uh i used to write world cinema reviews i remember writing about fellini's eight and a half and uh haneke's the white ribbon and satan it's, tango lost. Yeah. Ta- satan tango which is belatar this hungarian filmmaker uh, art house filmmaker who makes films which have an average shot length of 4 minutes and they are black and white and nothing happens for a while the camera doesn't move the people don't move and it goes on forever and this is a 7 and 7 and a half hour film and i watched it twice to review and there was so much of passion that you feel like doing so much in with it and uh, i mean i was writing and also trying to learn from it it was more like academic insight into these films and uh, by the way my my two cats are called uh, named after these two filmmakers fellini and bellatar so one is fellini one is bella uh, from there here i am after so many years uh, making extravagant wedding uh, uh episodes of rich people so my journey has been quite something uh throughout i think my fulcrum of things that i'm part of has remained the same gender caste sexuality denial these are sort of certain themes that i like and i'm i've been part of it uh i think that has not changed what has changed is i think uh so i have actually root the fact that i've actually haven't been uh into cinema from an academic standpoint of because i'm i'm a very academic sort of person and i miss the fact that i didn't go to a film school he has uh but sadly so, <laughs> so i used to feel that i i'm lacking something so i really self taught myself i was um i got into films because i started assisting anurag kashyap on gangs of wasipur so two and a half years on that film was my film school and uh, at that time actually i met a nice gentleman a filmmaker who told me a very valuable piece of advice which also is going to scare some of you is that passion is finite you know because we assume that our passion is going to be there forever and we're going to forever feel this rigor but as per law of physics it dissipates over time so that really pushed me into wanting things happen because i when i entered industry I had a corporate career before this. I was a brand manager. From there, I just suddenly quit, yada yada, and then here I am. So, um, if I reflect back, I think uh, I've made very less amount of movies and short films. But I think I've at least stuck to um, what I really believe in. It's not about many people ask that you like people. Anurag makes fun of me that he says that he'll only. I'm, I'm not, I haven't made a film in ten years. He says I'll only make a film when it goes to main competition in Cannes. but the point is that you know i actually want to make films that it speaks to me and it 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 should just all go well with my politics and yeah so in terms of technical style i think um i missed uh, doing a lot of visual uh, audio visual uh, impetus in masan i wish i had done more so now i i i actually went with vengeance and like uh, there's a film called gili puchi that i made it's part of this anthology I don't know how many of you seen it, uh, but that one I like. I studied Fincher. I studied so many filmmakers, and I tried to like speak a lot of uh, uh, cinematic language. Oh, I'm so sorry. It must have been terrible for you to like translate all the bullshit that I've been spewing here. Yeah, I'm done with my long yeah. winding answer. So this quote about passion is interesting. I also have a quote about passion because I worked in Bombay for some time, and also with some filmmakers who didn't pay me. So I wrote one day in my diary that passion is oppression because they used to do it in the name of passion for cinema. So, uh, but 
if, if you talk about these passion these blogs and these there was a time when like more fight club was also there by so main and there was a bustling time of cinephiles when different kind of films were being made there was a lot many independent filmmakers who were making films even from fti there were different kind of cinema alternative cinema which is getting produced but over the years that definition of cinema has also changed since the um, i think when ott platforms came then everybody jumped into that and it became more like corporatized and there were things which you can say there are things which you can't say so initially there was a hope from the ott that it might be somewhat more free more freedom but recently what i'm seeing that it has also become just like a clone and on the top of that the narrative of uh, these films are also very much similar in 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 a way that uh, they approach any theme um, especially in the episodic narrative it became very um, very similar and then there is also a different kind of content driven cinema which is mostly made for the sensibility of dominant caste people if i look at it like they represent their culture and everything which borrows from the independent filmmaking and also some form of commercial cinema and some bit in between them and lot many independent filmmaker are also now looking for these ott releases and everything and that whole space of making film outside um, the domain of these these uh, things became diminished over over the over the years so which is also okay because uh, uh, hard hitting films are hardly hit films so they are also you know need to find some venues to support themselves which i don't blame them but just to look at it from critically how do you look at the whole structure of cinema which has changed this otts and which format do you like the most personally like you want to see your film theatrically or you are okay with ott as well see every filmmaker worth the salt would want to see their film in theatrically that's a given but i feel ott has definitely democratized uh, viewing democratized the way films are funded um narratives have changed narratives have evolved uh, there is a lot of freedom in terms of how uh, you can be very immersive you can be expansive in your characters even subplots get a lot of things um you know so that way i think it really helps to uh, because filmmakers like me instantly i get to have my stuff seen by two 200 countries in one instance so that is a very good change uh and also that i think um because see like a film like gilipuch that i mentioned earlier i couldn't have made a theatrical out of it nobody would pay for it nobody would i don't know want to go to a theater and see it so yes i got to say those narratives if not for ott it wouldn't have been possible while saying that i also feel that um i i feel the corporatization of it all somewhere feels a little um because everything is looked from a statistical point of view what is going to work what is not going to work even uh, so any script or any language this thing is, is is a creative medium so you cannot quantify creativity you cannot say that this is what is going to work and this is what is going to predict and in terms of the same thing like if you see um there are fits and falls of both of them both can coexist i feel in terms of uh ott space also not just ott is general the the censorship that you see that you that's happening uh with our industry uh what happens is that there is a public fear of say uh something that hurts my sentiment or this thing that okay th- th- this community has oppressed me this community has said something this person has said something now this public fear is goes into uh, the cinema cinematic world where it comes to, in the form of uh, censorship where uh, before even going to the censor board there are multiple levels of censorship that are happening right now as we speak the first level is writers we are sitting in a room we are sitting in the writers room and we are wondering maybe this this will have, hurt someone this can't, we can't do i think this may not fly this audience may not understand so we are cut, cutting down everything we're making a sanitized version of what our voice could be and from there on we go with a lot of math done around it trying to make it work with all the high beats that you have let go because of the fear that it may not pass it may not, it may get stuck at the sense about or someone will get offended or the producer may not like that it is such a 
uh, incendiary kind of a script. From there, the second level happens where producers, uh, they will be even more afraid. They'll say, uh, it's already cut down. From there, there's further down, further more funneling down. And when the actors come on board, even they will have issues that maybe I don't want to play this part. Maybe, I, you know, this is not good for my image or this will happen. So there are multiple levels of censorship that are happening that is curtailing the voice. And I feel, uh, uh, you know, there was a interesting thing that happened in London where the filmmaker uh, was protesting. His Now, actually, it's very really confusing. You may call it art, you may call it stupidity. This, because this filmmaker's film is called uh, uh, Watching Paint Dry. So he shot an eight hour, eight, a 10 hour film where he just shot a wall, uh, he just painted it and he just shot it getting dry. And the censor board there had to just watch it. And that was his thing. He just, he just wanted to like, you know, so sadly we can't do that. You know, sadly we can't. So um, coming to theatrical, I feel there is, uh, it's an exciting time to be in. We have a lot of big uh, blockbuster films and these are required. They, they have to be. And actually I don't, uh, I don't feel entertainment should be an enemy of art or vice versa. We should have all kinds of films. We should celebrate all kinds of films. And um, I love it that, you know, that films like Jawan or Rocky Rani are doing so well because maybe independent films get funded because of the, uh, that revenue coming in. There's, it is encouraging time to put in and maybe we'll be seeing in theatricals. But the point that I sort of worry, I may be wrong, I hope I'm pro proven wrong, is that this whole mega blo blockbuster thing is leading into a thing where extreme machismo is the juggernaut that drives any of it. And, uh, you know, women has, have taken so long to actually get there and make their, and not just women narratives, many queer narratives, a lot of these narratives will get sidelined because if a mega blockbuster has to be, it has to be only an action driven um, male bastion of uber masculinity, you know, so, and it normalizes it. Because it makes it aspirational, it makes it cooler. So that's my worry, you know, per se, because I hope, I mean, will there ever be a Hamapke Khan again to become a blockbuster? Or there's going to be only action films that are going to be like, you know, yeah. This is an interesting point that you said about entertainment versus uh, some form of uh, these uh, social values that, yeah. that can be the part of cinema. And this tension has always been the part of cinema since the beginning. If you look at the Soviet montage film or Feinstein montage film or from the new wave cinema, which were also ex French new wave cinema or Taiwani new waves, Iranian new waves, or all this Italian neo-realism neo cinema, they were exploring these themes. But there is also, like some people think cinema is a form of entertainment and everything you have to do is to entertain the masses or whatever pu public and uh, there is other form that it can be an important socio-political tool so i would be interested to know how do you think of cinema cinema in in that form is it uh, the craft of storytelling is more important than the messaging because sometimes it also happens that some films are very heavy in their political messaging and survive through the morality of a uh, few public but in 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 terms of craft these some some of the films are very weak so how do you resolve this you know dilemma of putting the right politics and as well as making film which is aesthetically pleasing well that is something that i actually struggle with also uh, but how i navigate through that i feel um, like i said entertainment and art are not incongruous they can also coexist uh, you, you can make films that uh, see first of all the idea or the, the definition of entertainment is a little lopsided because you uh, traditionally the idea is that escape is cinema dima ghar pe rakke jao all of those connotations are applied to entertainment but it could also be you know stuff that's engaging that's motivating that's that makes you think and ponder that makes you question that makes you uh, think about things that differ in opinions it could want to maybe uh, talk about a new culture that you've not known. It could talk about various things, gender, sexuality, and all of these things that could matter. And it could mean that it, it provokes a certain feeling in you. It may be not always be ha ha ha, but it could also be something that you go home and you think about it. Like uh, there are many people here who actually 
when they watch a great film, it stays with them for two, three days. And it does change, you know, society does change because of even entertaining film. Like I, one anecdote that I remember is my mother. Uh, she saw Santoshi Mata a movie and for over a decade, she has been doing the Somvar Vrat. And I don't know why she did it. Like, I mean, uh, for so you can see and, and also that the sense of um, so that is one example that how like even if you look at Swades, that film, uh, I mean, at that time, I really, really loved it. I now have some, certain issues with it. But even that could be like it, it wasn't a box office success, but it made you you really want to go back and watch it. And it did bring change where many people who uh, came back. Many wrong people came back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I so agree with you. <laughs> so I feel just, um, in that and also, you know, th there's this thing about how we feel message cinema or anything. I feel we should, uh, firstly, you know, the, if I have to go back and talk about certain things that, you know, a lot of people say that I'm apolitical. I actually don't understand how can you be apolitical. Because in our country, in India, uh, you're either uh, deriving uh, benefits and mooching off from a privilege of being a certain community. It could be caste, gender, sexuality, religion, a lot of these things. So, and uh, uh, it is somewhere also state intercepted. So you are deriving the benefits of it. You could be blissfully unaware of it. You could be totally ob oblivious about it. But it does exist, even if you don't believe in it, it does exist. And the other half of that binary are people who are denied of these things and you don't get uh, those privileges. And together you form democracy. You form, uh, you know, these two, uh, the two sides of this binary help form democracy. So how can you say you are apolitical? Our mere existence as Indians is political because uh, you know, so from there, that point, I feel everything I do have to have certain kind of, because it's in our being, so I don't have to craft, oh, I have to put something political in it. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of you might say, made in heaven, I get it, like I buy that criticism, that it may seem like every episode has had that one thing. But for me, I feel, uh, I don't want to be that person where, so I feel narrative above politics. You know, that is what I've learned from many of the masters, especially uh, Satyajit Ray, where I feel uh, your voice and your craft and your politics cannot supersede the narrative. You know, if, the, if it does, if my films, ha my politics gets bigger than my narrative, then I'm a two-hour newsreel. I am at best, uh, I'm also a propagandist. Even if it a good cause, I'm still a propagandist. Because cinema has to be art. It has to be, it has to say it in a certain sense, it has to have a technical um, dexterity to it, it has to have flair to it, it has to have a kind of storytelling. So, and in, it did happen, you know, like for many years I toured around, uh, for some reason, I wanted to do a film on farm crisis and farmers and the suicides. For three years I toured around India and and, and I was so gung about doing it and I wrote something and I made my friends hear it and I chucked it after three years because I realized that I was too passionate about the politics, but the story was not making sense. So I never want to ride on the coattails of making something that is socially relevant or important film or a message film. You know, I want to be judged for my craft and I want to be seen, uh, not be given pats on the back for making something important. But if my craft is weak, I would like to be called out. Interesting that like to come to your recent Made in Heaven. Um, I think I just hit my Achilles heel right here. Sorry? <laughs> I hit my Achilles heel. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, especially the weddings in, in, in popular culture, um, they are projected in certain ways, especially in these post 90s uh, films like Hum Aap Khe Kaun, Karan Jor Universe. In fact, so many of the weddings in India started mimicking the aesthetics of the wedding that were being shown in the in the cinema and cinema has always played uh, an aspirational role in in romance in marriage and in, in fact i remember when i was in a in the college 
thanks to Karan Johar, I used to think that uh, the road to romance goes through a cringe shop named Archie's Gallery. So, <laughs> so, so it it has an influence. Pop culture has a big influence on your. Zoe, I will be happy to know this. <laughs> So, so it has an influence on, on 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 people, and they mimic those and make 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 them as as their aspirational goal. And so there was a certain kind of wedding and everything which was happening all the all the time that we see in the popular culture. But your recent um, show broke that uh, tradition, and you introduced Ambed cried Buddhist wedding, which many people in India were not aware of that it it happens. Even the many Dalits from the northern India were not aware that this kind of wedding is also possible. So this becomes a very revolutionary frame in itself because it provides, it generates a new kind of aspiration. So I really want to understand um, while you're making that, uh, that, that episode, what kind of conversation were you having in your head? Uh, actually, it came from like, I think, Zoya and the writers, Alankrita, Reema, uh, they wanted to have a conversation about this in one of their episodes and when they brought me in we had a long chat I mean I think I don't think they knew so Bollywood is quite unaware of caste they are not caste blind they don't know caste they they only understand class um, so uh, yeah many times they actually mistake uh, that happens to a lot of people they mistake caste as class like the ghar pe jo bartan hum sa alag rakhte hain staff ke liye people think it's class it's actually it has come from caste uh, anyway sorry for the digression uh, with this episode i actually also wanted to start a narrative where um, so if you look at look back from the cinema that was and all the stuff that you've seen there are handful of films on dalit narratives and they're always seen from a Savarna Savior complex gaze. You know, you'll always see them, us as subjects, subjects of oppression, subject of state subjugation, but we are never fully blown characters with blood and you know, with, with, with skin and with a with lot of flair and with a lot of things that mean like, what sort of ice cream I like, what sort of movies I like, what, what is my take on things? Where's my agency? So, and so they're always shown in a particular uh, society, in a particular thing. So that was also had to be broken because we're not just poor people who wear half dhoti and sit in the sun and yell. You know, we also sit here, like we, we speak like the way everyone does. So that also had to be hap happen. And in this wedding, actually, um, so it's a very interesting story because when as I grew up, so my sister's wedding, I did not want to go. Because, you know, for the longest time, for the long time of my life, I've been passing off as a Savarna. I was too scared to admit to my caste identity. And uh, it has created a deep impact in me. I, the imposter syndrome that I told you, it comes, stems from there, the insecurity, all of it comes from there. Uh, to live a life for such a long time, it, it did something to me. Um, with... Uh, but then I thought that if I go to my sister's wedding with this Buddhist wedding where you'll also see Ambedkar photo, if my friends come with me, they will know. And I'll be found. And, uh, you know, it was, I, I felt so ashamed that I don't want to go to my own sister's wedding. And from there on, I think I found, a, found courage. And even, you know, even during Masan, um, a little digression, but like even while I was making Masan, I was in Banaras. And for some reason, all of these people were so much in love with me. The pe they would open their homes and they would uh, want me to shoot. And if I even speak of money, they'll get offended. That is the kind of love they were giving it to me. And I was inside, I was like, what if they know? All of this is going to go away. And I live with that fear. Like my best friend Varun who was a writer. Even he did not know. So this fear stays with you. So that I had to like exercise those demons somehow or the other. And... I did so gradually, but in this episode, it was I put a lot of myself in it. Like if you see uh, the brothers track, is actually me uh, because where I many years back on Twitter, actually with, because of something, I think you all know how I proclaim my identity on Twitter. Uh, so after that, uh, Bombay Times did a long piece, and I didn't realize it was going all India, and. 
I was petrified for three days, like I couldn't go out or whatever. Uh, so a lot of my extended family colleagues and uh, you know cousins and everyone would take pride. You know that Masan filmmaker, that's my cousin, that's my this thing. And most of them were passing, most of them were hiding, most of them were masquerading. And once I that news piece story came out, I inadvertently outed all of them. And they were not happy about it. And it is fair that, you know, like, so it, it's a very complex situation. What do I do? What was right? What was not? And even my passport still carries the name uh, Kumar, you know, uh, because my father said, yeah, put Kumar. And now I reclaim my last name as Gevan. So all of those came in and then I thought, okay, since I'm so petrified of this Buddhist wedding that I've seen in my family happening, but I've never been able to let me just give it a lot of, let me show it with a lot of aplomb and flair and, you know, uh, make it the best wedding. So that was the idea. And I pushed those limits and I said that do not compromise on anything. Like some of the minutest detail that I, nobody knows, like, you know, the Mangal Sutra is made by Bulgari. So I was like, okay, they have to get as much great stuff that they could. And also, you know, about talking about the wedding landscape as such, like, I feel a, a small thing about like colors, palettes, if you see in weddings, they've all become pastel. And pastel is such a colonial fixation. You know, what happened to saturated colors? What happened to the nice red? What happened to the right, bright greens? You know, all of that has gone. So I, I, I also had that thing that, you know, uh, uh, because uh, we don't see that anymore. And in this wedding particularly, um, there was, there was a the, the lot of seeding in that I did, which I think you must have cracked one of these, but the, the walk into the water. And I couldn't remember why I was, like to production, I was telling them, you have to find a water body. It has to be around a water body. And uh, I think it was, because it's a very subtle homage to Chauda Tank. You know, the, the eponymous like event that happened when Ambedkar took many people to wa have water for public consumption and they were booed away, they were put in jails. So it was sort of that. So in more ways, I think it is my, yeah, sorry I got carried. You talked about very interesting that access to spaces kind of thing when you were shooti shooting in Banaras and you are scared that these spaces might not be accessible, um, which is very true for many uh, creatives who, who are working and marginalized create creative because they might not be welcomed at certain spaces. So there is a fear even in that process of Reiki and everything that maybe like they are talking very sweetly to me, but there might be chances when they get to know um, the mood changes. So there is a fear within that creative setup as well, which I... I also see like, for example, even the YouTube vlogs, the, these uh, white vloggers, when they come to any places, they are welcomed everywhere. They can shoot, you know, go into any house they want. But if there is a black, yeah. black creator, then, yeah. you know, the, those spaces are not accessible. The people are not going to seem kind of friendly or they are not going to get the content that they want to um, produce. So that is there, which, which I wanted to say. But uh, uh, it is, I also wanted to know how, how did you, since you said that people in the Bollywood doesn't know about caste, and I also experienced it uh, once while I was uh, I, I was a uh, interview at giving an interview at uh, um, ad, ad agency, and, and they said, "What what else do you do?" I said, "I also write on uh, Dalit issues." Dalit, are they they do they exist in cities? Man, yeah, man, they do exist in cities. So <laughs> so that, that is the level of understanding. So in, in that scenario, how did you make them understand the nuances of how the cast operates, especially with the actors, like they have to act and they are from the privileged cast, yeah. the, the actors. So what was that process? How did you make them understand that how it functions, how it happens to your team as well, your assistants, your you know cameraman, and how, how did that conversation happen? See, like I said, um, Bollywood is not casteist. Uh, it's just that they're ignorant about it. But when I spoke about, explained to them the nuances and I took them into a lot of things like how it happens, um, they were very welcoming and they didn't want to leave any stone unturned. Uh, you know, really thanks to Zoya and Rima who were part of the showrunners because they really made a point that, you know, we, this wedding has to look the best. You know, 
even though they also had other episodes that they were directing and they wanted but they they thing was that you know we want to show it the best way and nothing was compromised and you know like uh it's it's sort of lonely for me to be here uh in this industry to be literally the only dalit okay and i want to give you a context of how it feels like uh because i actually don't have any reference point i don't have people who i can my own people who i can refer to like so many of my filmmakers go back and you watch yesterday's cinema and you have a reference point and you have there are no names or nothing now one example that i i keep telling that you might wonder about like uh in all of history of hindi cinema all of it okay there have been four five films that have been made on uh dalit uh, narratives made by savarna filmmakers and all of these 60 years 70 years now there has been no single dalit person okay and uh, you look at the statistics or even a tribal person uh, in front of camera behind camera not a single artist but here actually if i ask you would you name any black artist you'll have 100 names popping in your head right now okay and uh but if i told you that you know there is only one director called jordan peel who is the only director black director in all of hollywood everybody is white imagine that person's plight that he has no reference point no fellow people he can make films with and coming back to the same argument about this thing now look at the statistics okay i might be wrong but i'm quoting the last census uh 16.6% dalits roughly together if you make dalits and adivasi it will be 25% population in america uh you see how many black people are there in hollywood how many films and how many uh things that they are creating that population is 16% black population in america is 16% here you have 25% of population that has been completely removed there is not a single person the only person that has been is who's posthumously known is lyricist chelendra posthumously so it is extremely lonely and you don't have so I, i it took a long while for me actually to to make this thing and which is why i think people respect and which is why i think people are very cordial and that's why even this made in heaven episode actually they 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 were so gung ho about making it the best you know interesting that you named shailendra and he was the greatest uh, poet greatest lyricist one of the greatest lyricist in india from dalit background but he has to hide his identity there was he no surname him, he hid himself in his lyrics if you go back and listen to his lyrics you'll you'll know if you know want, you know want to talk about more it is it would be very interesting yeah no i mean uh, i actually uh, no it feels uh, surreal you know to see the most respected lyricist of all time uh could not claim his identity fully he could not live his, his life fully yeah, he has to live uh i would say unfulfilled because he could never be himself yes his art was magnanimous but he could never stake claim as a person that he owns up to fully and to be only known posthumously and and still i'm telling you bollywood doesn't know that shailendra was uh, adal his son recently to spoke about it so like imagine in your environments wherever you're working uh say you're the only person from that community in all of it how would you feel working like imagine okay say a woman is working in uh in a very male dominated society a workplace you know uh there is no single woman how would you feel that woman will what will she go through so those are the questions that we need to ask and start and this this whole thing about representation and also trying to understand it's like sometimes i feel that the honors also lies on savarnas you know because it's your ancestors who've done this okay so don't reach out to any marginalized community and say that can you educate me about your community a little more hey you're trans can i know a little more about you why don't you put some effort in educating yourself the onus does not re- rely on a marginalized person to explain to you to go through you have to go through and understand it you if you have to make an effort because it is your ancestors who who done this and sort of it's 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 like it's your shame you own up to it and make amends 
like you're not doing any charity you're not doing anything well you're just um doing reparations for something that fair you're not responsible but at least uh generationally it has caused a big issue right i think we just have I completely went off topic but yeah <laughs> we just have 2 minutes left so final question is a personal question for myself how, how do i how do i watch a 3 hour film when my mind is corrupted by 60 seconds of reel <laughs> all right I, which is also happening to me by the way i wake up i try to write uh like it's very difficult for me to write this first time i'm actually writing myself uh it's very difficult i wake up at 4 am and i decide okay morning time i will be like nice i play with my cats a little bit and then i go back and i'm writing and i'm looking at reels it is unending and like uh, you realize that oh it's 9 am already and uh, it's an epidemic of uh uh i actually don't have an answer because i don't because i know this is a thing that we'll all have to like be with it it's yeah i can't Got you have a solution got to do pranayam and all these things like you know okay so can we open it to the audience uh yeah like you said poly- your narrative sh- politics should not supersede n- 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 the yeah. narrative so then how do you distinguish between uh, po- uh, like narrative and let's say propaganda and how do you like it should does this statement mean that your politics should be hidden or it should be implicit or it should not come out openly like can you just elaborate on this statement because it's a very interesting statement that you ma- made <laughs> lovely question um so what i mean to say is that um, there are certain beliefs that you believe in you but you have to remember that you're making a narrative about characters okay so the character lives in i may live in a certain cities i dress up certain different i have different accent whatever but if i'm making a character it has to be truer to that character how they speak what is the lingo that they speak it cannot be that okay i believe in a certain politics like because of where i come from what i do what my belief system is uh, i might say a line you know like say um this whole cancel culture is is toxic to uh queer narratives let's say i i mean it's not making sense entirely but take it if this was if you if my character in masan say deepak says that line in hindi you will feel like okay this is not deepak's voice it is my voice so then it is politics superseding the narrative because deepak's world is different deepak's priorities problems are different even his politics is different even if he says that politics it has to come from that language or it has to have a certain cinematic language in in expressing that you can't just nakedly say and get an extra star in a review because you spoke about an important thing it has to come from the world i hope i've answered your question hello sir um on one hand as you said there is a culture of reel and 30 seconds while on the other hand we also have the culture of binge watching where we sit for 6 6 hours 7 7 hours and binge watch entire shows so what is your opinion on that like is the tensions guilty as charged i mean i binge watch so much i can't tell you like sometimes um uh, i to feel that i think it's it's because uh sometimes reality is like too stark like during covid times i think to immerse yourself into a world that where also binging i feel it's also because i've been battling a lot of mental health issues so it also gives you uh, tones down my anxiety because i know that this is only a thing and the killer will be found and it justice will happen so i don't have to worry as much so that's why i think you binge because it feels safer it feels safer to like i mean this is a very abstract point but it gives me more anxiety 10 ghante tak kon wait kare kon killer hai pura it's a very anxious you know experience but but which is the yeah. last good experience would you, would you want that kind of anxiety or you would you want that is my my employer calling what do i do which is the anxiety you choose but which is the last good binge experience you had in terms of series or something which you really lo- love whole experience i can't get over mind hunter i've seen all seasons thrice 
So my question is, how do you find a good balance between uh, creative liberty and uh, taking care of the fact that uh, whatever liberty you're going to take should not uh, disrespect any community or any kind of people? And how do you move towards creating a more mature audience that doesn't take everything personally that is represented in the media? Thank you. Oh, I mean, I'm also seeking the answer for those kind of questions. But I feel... Um, See, to be crea creative liberty versus how do you present stories, I have one phrase for it. To, for, for any community that you want to make films on, that is not yours, is lived experience. You cannot create, recreate lived experience of someone else's. You can empathize, but you cannot be there. Okay, so the only way that you can make truer narratives, uh, be it gender, sexuality, queer narratives, you have to involve people from the communities. That's only when you'll get the authentic experience. And you have to give them power positions. You can't just say that, okay, put them in a corner. No, you have to bring them into like, uh, make important changes, make, uh, suggest like this doesn't work, this doesn't happen. You have to listen to them. You cannot uh, think that, you know, because then it is that whole savior complex that a lot of uh, filmmakers currently also who make narratives on either Dalit or queer narratives, they feel like they have the patronizing gaze that I have made a film, I have made a film about your community. Praise me. You know, no. You are doing it purely out of commerce because like you, Lagan, you'll get social equity out of it. Like Lagan, Article 15, these, these kind of films. Yeah. No comments. <laughs> the number of hands are increasing with every question. How much time do you have? It's up. One question, one, one last question, please. Okay, she's been raising for quite some time. She's been raising a hand. Gray, uh, yeah. Thank you, sir, for noticing. Hello, sir. Sir, it must be terrifying being the only Dalit person in the entire industry. And you also mentioned the layers of censorship a story go, goes through before it reaches the audience. So how do you not feel defeated in that? Do you still see light at the end of the tunnel that one day a filmmaker's true story will reach the audience uncensored? Do not feel defeated or frustrated by the process? There is an idealistic answer to that is that you'll have to go along, no matter what happens. You have to go with it. Uh, I mean, look at Iranian filmmakers. They are in like police custody, they are making movies. Uh, I guess, and also there's another answer to it is that, you know, there are smarter ways to do it. Uh, because sometimes it, it feels like you're really taking daggers on. You're really poking at fingers. But I think when you genuinely engage in conversations, I'll give you an example of Gili Puchi where my intent was not to like, put down any, any community. Because there are bad apples in every community. You know, no community is a monolith. And there are bad apples in every community. So they, it was just a bad person, like this person has been tutored by her mother, by her employer, that ye log nahi hote. And she got carried away with that. So you just have, you should not come from a point of um, attacking or tone policing or anything. It should have a genuine conversation where pe change should come. I mean, I, I really feel that it should. So, yeah. But when censor board censors your film, do you go home and say, kai khatam nahi hote re? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much for Thank joining you guys. Us. Thank you, Media Rambal. Thank you, Neeraj.